I'm going to show you how to misuse delegate call. In other words, I'm going to show you how to shoot yourself in the foot by showing you examples of smart contracts that misuse delegate call. Hopefully, you'll recognize how to use it in a safe way and how to use it in an unsafe way. In this video, I'll quickly explain what delegate call is. And then I want to show you two examples over the next two videos. This video is part one. We'll explore a simple example of unsafe delegate call. In part two, we'll look at a more sophisticated example. All right, let's briefly go over what delegate call is. When contract A calls contract B using delegate call, it's basically telling contract B to run your code inside my context. So the code inside contract B will be run using the storage of contract A, message.sender, message.value, message.data, and etc. This means that when you're using delegate call, there are two things that you should keep in mind. One, delegate call preserves context, which I explained above. And the second thing to keep in mind is that storage layout must be the same for both A and B. What I mean by this is that both contract A and contract B must declare the same state variables in the same exact order. So what can go wrong when we don't keep these two things in mind? Well, that is what we'll be exploring in this and the next video. And in this video, we'll go over an example of how to misuse delegate call when we forget that it preserves context. Here is a contract called hack me. It has a state variable called owner, which is set inside the constructor when this contract is deployed. The challenge is to change the owner, in other words, hijack this contract, even though this contract doesn't have any functions to update the owner. So the owner is set inside the constructor, and the other function that we have here is a fallback function, which doesn't look like it updates the owner state variable. Now, if you look inside the fallback function, it uses the delegate call function. And who does it delegate the call to? Well, it delegates the call to the state variable lib, which is another contract that is set inside the constructor. So what does the contract lib do? Let's take a look. Contract lib declares a single state variable called owner, and it has a single function called pwn. When this function is called, it sets the owner state variable to message.sender. With these two contracts, how can we change the owner state variable inside the hack me contract? Go ahead and pause the video if you want to figure out how to update the owner state variable inside the hack me contract. I'll give you a hint. Delegate call preserves context. All right, let's walk through how to update the owner state variable inside the hack me contract. In other words, we're going to be hijacking this contract by updating the owner. Now, the only way to interact with this contract is by invoking the fallback function. And we know that the fallback function is triggered when a function that does not exist inside this contract is called. Which means that here we can call this fallback function by calling a function that does not exist inside the hack me contract. When the fallback function is called, it delegates the call to the lib contract, which forwards message.data to the lib contract. Inside message.data, we can craft the data so that it will call any function that we want inside the lib contract. Inside the lib contract, the function that we want to call is pwn which will set the owner state variable to message.sender. In this case, message.sender will be us, the person who is trying to hijack the hack me contract above. Now, why would calling the function pwn inside the lib contract update the state variable owner inside the hack me contract? Well, this is because delegate call runs the code inside lib using the storage of hack me. So here, the code that will update the owner state variable will be executed using the storage of hackme. And this will update the owner state variable inside hackme contract. Let's write this exploit in code. We'll create a contract called attack. And we'll store the address of the hackme contract in a state variable called hackme. Now, the actual address of the hackme contract will be set when we deploy this contract. So we'll pass the address of the hackme contract into the constructor. 
and then set it to the state variable hack me. We'll create a function called attack, and this will be the function that we're going to be calling in order to update the owner's state variable inside the hack me contract. So what is it that we have to do here? Our goal here is to call the pwn function inside the lib contract, which we can do by calling the fallback function inside the hack me contract and then passing in the function signature of pwn for message.data. That is what we'll do inside the attack function. So here we'll say hack me dot call. And we call that call is a low level function where we can pass our message.data inside here. And the message.data that we need to pass in here is the function signature of pwn which we can easily create by calling abi.encode with signature. And the function signature that we want to create here is pwn. That completes the code for the function attack. Let's quickly go over how this attack will work. When we call the attack function, it will call the hack me contract. And the function that it will try to call inside the hack me contract is pwn. But since the function pwn does not exist inside the hack me contract, it will call the fallback function instead. The fallback function will delegate call to the lib contract and forward the message.data. Delegate call calls the lib contract, and since we sent message.data to match the pwn function, the function pwn inside lib contract will be executed, which will run the code to update the owner state variable. And since delegate call runs its code using the storage of hack me contract, we'll actually update the owner state variable inside the hack me contract. Now I want to demonstrate this exploit in Remix. We'll say that the first account is Alice and she is gonna deploy the hack me contract. The second account is Eve and she is the person that is gonna deploy the attack contract and call the attack function. Here I've deployed three contracts. First, Alice deployed the lib contract. Next, she took the address of the lib contract and then deployed the hack me contract. And then Eve deployed the attack contract with the address of hack me contract. First, let's check the owner of the hack me contract and make sure that it belongs to Alice. So I'm gonna click the owner and that is the owner. I'm gonna scroll up and make sure that that the owner is Alice. Next, Eve is going to call the attack function, so we'll switch account to Eve. Scroll down, and then call the attack function. And you can see here that the transaction to attack was successful. So let's check back on the owner of hack me contract, and make sure that the owner is no longer Alice. So I'm going to click the owner again. And you can see here that the owner has changed. And who is this owner? Well, it's going to be the person or the contract that called the fallback function inside the hack me contract. And in this case, it was the attack contract. So you can see here that the address of the attack contract is the new owner of the hack me contract. So that was an example of what can go wrong when you forget that delegate call preserves context. In the next video, I'm going to show you what can go wrong when the storage layout for a contract A and B are different. Thanks for watching and see you later.